Okay, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Koyo Kuo. I'm the curator of this series of talks and uh, artistic director of 154. Uh, welcome to the second day after the opening uh, day of the conversations uh, uh, yesterday afternoon, where we discussed uh, various trends of uh, concerns around uh, African and African-American artistic practice uh, from artistic point of view and also institutional. We continue today with uh, a very interesting panel. First of all, I really would like to thank all the speakers here uh, for accepting our invitation. And I know that for many of them, at least for Franklin, coming all the way from LA, to be with us in New York is deeply appreciated. And uh, I will go on to introduce uh, Stephen Nelson, who will be moderating the, this conversation about cultural specific curating in institution, and what does that mean, and how does it play out, how is it uh, possible or not possible. And, uh, and uh, Stephen will go on to introduce uh, uh, the speakers. Stephen Nelson is professor of African and African American art history at the University of California, Los Angeles. He's currently the Cohen Fellow at Harvard University's Hutchings Center for African, Ameri African and African American Research. That stumbling about African and African American was a discussion yesterday. <laughs> and it was, a, it was very interesting, and maybe we, could, we can go back to it uh, today. Stephen is tre a treasurer of the National Committee for History of Art and chair of the advisory board for the National Gallery Center for Advanced Visual Studies. He is also a reviews editor for the Journal of the Society of Architectural Historians and a contributing editor to Grove Art Online. His 2007 book, From Cameroon to Paris, Muscoon Architecture in and Out of Africa, has won multiple awards and he has published widely on the contemporary and artistic, uh, historic arts, architecture, and urbanism of Africa and its diasporas, African American art history, and queer studies. He is currently completing two books titled Structural Adjustment, Mapping Geography and the Visual Cultures of Blackness and On the Underground Railroad. Please welcome Stephen Nelson. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Koyo. Thank you for that lovely introduction. And also thank you and thank Gabriella for bringing us all together. Um, Gabrielle has, been, you know, has done the yeoman's task of dealing with you know, at least four times five or six or 19 or 20 of us getting to Brooklyn, complaining about it and doing whatever. <laughs> and we thank you very much. Um, so I'm, I'm very excited to talk about you know, the subject at hand in this panel, which is uh, cultural curating in institutions. But before we do that, I would like to present our three very fantastic uh, presenters. Um, first, first up, and we're going to go, I, I am an art historian who does not know my left from my right, and so we're going to go right to left, so as, as if you're reading Arabic, um, I think, all right? Yes, it is, okay. Um, Krista Clark, all right, is senior curator of the Arts of Global Africa at the Newark Museum, and she was formerly curator of African art at the Newburger Museum of Art. A specialist in historic and contemporary African art, she's organized numerous exhibitions on a broad, ra broad range of subjects, and these include Power Dressing, Men's Fashion and Prestige in Africa in 2005, Another Modernity, Works on Paper by Uche Okeke in 2006, Embodying the Sacred in Yoruba Art in 2008, and Party Time, Reimagine America, and Centennial Commission by Yinka Shonabari MBE in 2009. Um, in addition to these practices, Krista has been a fellow at several institutions, and her publications include Representing Africa in American Art Museums, A Century of Collecting and Display, and this was co-edited with Kathleen Burzak in 2010. And she has a forthcoming book, and I'm really excited about this book, on the African art collection at the Barnes Foundation in Philadelphia. 
In 2012, Krista was a fellow at the Center for Curatorial Leadership, a program dedicated to expanding the leadership capability of curators to meet the challenges of the 21st century museum. So she rocks, all right? Um, <laughs> next we have Thomas Lax. And Thomas was appointed Associate Curator of Media and Performance at the Museum of Modern Art in 2014. For the previous seven years, he worked at the Studio Museum in Harlem, where he organized over a dozen exhibitions, and if we name them all, we will be here until Tuesday, um, as well as numerous screenings, performances, and public programs. Thomas is a faculty member at the Institute for Curatorial Practice and Performance at Wesleyan University Center for the Arts. He's on the advisory committee for the Vera List Center for Arts and Politics. He's on the Arts Advisory Committee of the Lower Manhattan Cultural Council. And he's a member of the Catalyst Circle at the Laundromat Project. He's also on the advisory board of Recess. He's a busy man. In 2015, Thomas was awarded the Walter Hopps Award for Curatorial Achievement. Um, last and certainly not least is my neighbor, Franklin Sermons. And Franklin, I'm sort of a little, you know, rah, rah LA, and that's probably after a winter in Boston. Um, <laughs> um, Franklin Sermons is department head and curator of contemporary art at the Los Angeles County Museum of Art. And from 2006 to 2010, he was curator of modern and contemporary art at the Menil Collection in Houston, where he organized several exhibitions, including Neo Hoodoo, Art for Forgotten Faith, Steve Wolf, Works on Paper, Maurizio Catalan, Is There Life Before Death, and Vijay Selman's Television and Disaster, 1964 to 1966. At LACMA, Sermons has installed variations, conversations in and around abstract painting, football, the beautiful games, ex ends and exits, contemporary art from the collections of LACMA and the Broad Art Foundation. And he has co-organized the exhibition Human Nature, contemporary art from the collection. He was arti the artistic director of Prospect 3, New Orleans, from 2012 to 2014. Franklin's exhibition, Noah Purifoy, Junk Dada, opens June 7th at LACMA, and if you all come, you can stay with him. Um, <laughs> so um, so the, way, the way that... <laughs> of course. Of course. <laughs> Don't you love shaming people publicly? Um, all right, so the way that this is going to go down, all right, is that each of our... Each of our panel members, working from right to left, is going to speak for a brief period, five to 10 minutes, and they will be timed, um, on, on a subject of interest to them within their own work and within you know, the, the sort of things going on in their brain. All right, and then we will open it up to a more general conversation, and then we will open it up to you because I don't I, I like you sort of using the resource of smart people in an audience when you know we have this sort of loosey goosey thing going on, and so I'm going to hand over the mic to Krista, and she will she will begin. Okay, can you all hear me? Okay, so um, thank you, Stephen, uh, for the wonderful introduction, and you rock as well. Um, and thank you for coming today. Uh, I'm just gonna speak a little bit about uh, collecting um, at the Newark Museum, uh, displaying Arts of Global Africa at the Newark Museum and exhibition practice. And I am going to breeze through my slides because I know Stephen is serious about cutting us off. And uh, I just want to begin, though, by talking about the institutional framework. Okay. Oops. Um, I think it's important to have an understanding about what, ki what kind of institution you're talking about when you talk about curatorial practice. And so I'm just going to start off by saying um, the Newark Museum is, is one of America's oldest museums. It was founded in 1909. Um, I know some of you here have been there. I welcome you all to take uh, a 15 minute New Jersey train, transit ride or path train across the river and, and come visit the museum. It's really easy to get to. Um, but we are a museum uh, founded in 1909 as a, a so-called encyclopedic museum, as an art and science museum um, in an era where the Brooklyn Museum and other museums were founded as art and science museums. And with a collection of historic arts of Africa that dates to 1917. Um, and so I steward a collection that embraces both historic and uh, contemporary, which is a point of emphasis I've, I've um, uh, 
continued uh, since I started at the Newark Museum 13 years ago. Uh, but this just, some of the works here just kind of speak to the range of our collection. It's a collection that spans the entire continent and includes North, South, and East Africa, as well as West and Central Africa, and a range of different artistic traditions, um, some of which are not easily embraced in, in uh, museums that have more of a modernist framework for looking at African art. So in, um, I came to the museum in 2002, and in 2003, um, with the approval of our board of trustees, we uh, revised our collecting guidelines to place more of an emphasis on the modern and contemporary arts of Africa. And at that time, the department was still known as uh, Africa, the Americas, and the Pacific, and so I feel like one of my proudest achievements at the museum has been to um, separate Africa from those um, other large parts of the world and add arts to it, and now recently arts of global Africa, which kind of speaks to some of the issues I'll, I'll be talking about. Um, but these are all works that we've collected over the past decade. Um, a wide range of works, uh, I think you're familiar with some of these artists, uh, work by Ella Natsui we collected in 2005, and I think collecting this so early when he was showing at Skoto Gallery is one of the ways uh, our trustees did not know who he was at the time, um, even though he had a distinguished three decade career in Nigeria, and it's paved the way for our uh, acquisition committee to embrace the work of artists that they're not familiar with. Um, and we most recently brought in the work by Serge Nittengeka on the bottom left there. I will say it's important to add that our uh, embrace of the contemporary is not just contemporary artists who are have working in a global contemporary art market way, but also uh, arts that are, represent contemporary artistic practice, whether it be um, uh, you know, popular urban culture, cement sculpture you see on the bottom here, uh, contemporary fashion as well, um, contemporary examples of jewelry, and contemporary masquerade costumes. So we have a very broad embrace. And another aspect of the collection is it does include the modern as well. And of course, this is not a category that you can collect comprehensively. So we're building the collection to uh, represent uh, modernist movements in certain parts of the African continent. Uh, strength of our collection is Nigerian modernism, um, thanks to a recent gift from Simon Ottenberg. Um, but I'm also trying to build the collection to represent important um, artists, uh, such as Ibrahim El Salahi. We purchased this 1964 painting on the bottom right uh, last year, I believe. Um, but also examples that represent other modern moments, uh, represent the mid-century Africa, a, um, a, a Zulu uh, a beaded dress ensemble from the 1970s, a wonderful example of factory print cloth from the late 1960s. So again, a broad definition of art history. Since the collection has grown to encompass uh, probably well over 500 works of modern and contemporary arts, we've tried to, one of the challenges is where do you make a space for this in the museum? And one of the things that's slightly unusual about the Newark Museum is although we historically have collected the art of our time, we have not, we do not have a standalone contemporary art department. And I will say that I think that that is one of the reasons why I've had such latitude in building the collection because it hasn't had to be vetted by a contemporary art curator that has a pre-existing notion that's predicated on Western artistic practices um, and is more familiar with um, art in, in, I would say, the centers because I think there still are centers. Um, but the challenge is that we don't also have a global contemporary space uh, in existence at, at the museum. And so, um, one of the ways I've presented some of the collection, I established a permanent gallery devoted to our permanent collection uh, called Present Tense, and uh, it's a small space, but I think it makes an important statement that these, this is a significant emphasis in the collection, and these, um, these works you know, rotate fairly frequently. Um, this was uh, the first iteration that opened in May 2010. But I also look for opportunities to place um, my, and I'm using uh, quotation marks, my collection within other spaces in the museum. And I work very closely. We have a very small curatorial staff. I work very closely with the other curators. Um, and so as an example of that, um, Odili Donald Odita's work, uh, which I brought into the collection, we had a work by his father, who was an important Nigerian uh, modernist. 
um, in the collection, thanks to Simon Ottenberg. So we brought his work in, but um, when we brought it in, we wanted to make connections with our historic collection of geometric abstraction in the Americas, and the work will be going on view in a cross-departmental collect collection exhibit in the fall. Lala Asadi's work, we have two photographs by her, and at one point they were both on view in our contemporary American galleries in a women's photography exhibition, American women's photography, and in present tense. So again, suggesting that these kind of uh, geographic boundaries are, are very fluid and ways to push back. And then Yinka Shonobari's Party Time project, which I commissioned in 2009, was a collaborative project with our decorative arts curator and was placed in our 1885 Victorian mansion that's part of the museum's campus in the dining room. And um, it's part of the permanent collection. It's not on permanent view, but we occasionally uh, put it out. So getting uh, arts from the African continent out and about. Um, through in exhibition practice is another way to uh, kind of uh, highlight um, artists from the continent. We have two exhibitions, two solo exhibitions of uh, artists from the African continent up, and I, I have to say I don't think a lot of museums uh, have this is a kind of rare occasion to be celebrating. Our major exhibition is um, photographs by Georgia Sodi um, from his Nigerian Monarchs series. I actually just wanted to add that these often give us opportunities to bring in works from the collection, the historic collection. So in this exhibition, the focus is firmly on Georgia's series and Georgia as an artist, but we've included examples of dress and regalia from our historic collection as kind of sartorial footnotes um, to provide context to the dress seen in the, in the photographs. Also on view is Hassan Hajaj, My Rock Stars, which is, um, features his, uh, Hassan's um, Rock Stars video, which Franklin is quite familiar with, uh, which the New York Museum acquired last year, and we recently acquired the related photographic series that go with this exhibition. These feature um, a wonderful series of performers and musicians from around the world where Hassan is um, placing them, kind of riffing on uh, studio portraiture traditions of the 50s and 60s in West Africa and fashion photography. And for this exhibition, he created a site-specific installation um, that included, uh, in place of using mass-produced objects, which he often uses in his salons and display cases, he uh, mined the collection um, looking at works so historic works from the entire continent that speak to cultural collision and another opportunity to kind of play with our collections. And finally, just to look at what's next, um, and just again, the, the benefit, I think, of having a historic baseline to work with. Uh, I don't always work with the historic collections. Sometimes they're very straightforward, but uh, I'm working on a project, upcoming exhibition project, which will focus on the story of this, this wonderful story of a Newark resident, Lida Clanton Bronner, who uh, worked as a domestic and as a hairstylist for 28 years, uh, saved her money, um, and went at age 46 to South Africa in 1938, um, where she toured for nine months. Um, she was very involved with the Council on African Affairs here in New York, which was led by W.E. Du Bois. It was an anti-colonialist agenda, a solidarity organization, and um, in South Africa, she was touring the, the black schools. She was speaking at them, speaking at the school where Nelson Mandela was a freshman, where Tabo and Becky's parents were teaching was mingling with the black Christian intelligentsia and bring, collecting along the way, mar largely through gifts, um, an interesting collection of beadwork, pottery, mission-produced um, mission works, um, a collection that is, stands as a really important antidote to the history of collecting African art, um, because this, as again, is collected by gifts. So I'm using this amazing story. We exhibited her collection in 1943, she gave it to us in 1947, and her grandsons came in recently with her diary, two photo albums, and two scrapbooks to tell this really amazing story, the story of African America, a story of South Africa. And I'm inviting four artists, um, two African American, two South African, to uh, create works um, for a contemporary art exhibition which will have this story at the heart of it. Um, so that's what we're up to in the Arts of Global Africa at the Newark Museum. And I hope I stayed within my time.
So as Stephen mentioned, my name is Thomas Lax, and I'm Associate Curator at the Museum of Modern Art. Um, thank you, Koyo and Gabriella and James um, and Stephen for this invitation and for facilitating, and also to my fellow panelists. It's a pleasure to be here with the two of you. Um, so when Koyo first invited me to be on this panel, she framed the conversation around the question of cultural specificity in um, what we might have, have originally called mainstream institutions, institutions that, while culturally specific, did not name themselves as such. Um, and given that I have kind of recently moved from the Studio Museum, which identifies as culturally specific, to the Museum of Modern Art, I don't have that many exhibitions at that institution to talk about. So instead, what I thought I would do um, was use this opportunity to kind of talk about a set of ideas that are animating um, a project that I'm currently working on, um, Greater New York, which um, is a collaboration between MoMA and MoMA PS1, which I'm co-curating with a group of three other curators. Um, and to kind of think through the larger terms of um, what that exhibition is trying to explore, bringing together artists living and working around New York City um, to think about the stakes of today's conversation. So um, that's a kind of political inflection to this idea of cultural specificity. So uh, my remarks today are clustered around two sets of ideas. One, what I would describe as the kind of appearance of black diasporic cultural productions at the nexus of relations on the global stage. And I'll talk about three examples of major exhibitions that have happened within the last six months that as I see it, position um, you know, the black Atlantic at the center of a conversation about um, global contemporary art. And the second part of my conversation, or my remarks, will be about the kind of acceleration of political claims that are being made in conjunction with exhibitions. So um, a kind of reconfiguration, as I'm understanding it, of how um, art, this category of art that we are all constantly trying to redefine, uh, might act politically. Um, and the relationship not only of of arts appearing in politics, or rather of politics appearing in art, but of art acting um, in the political world. So um, I will start by talking about an exhibition that Franklin organized, um, Prospect 3, Notes um, for Now. And um, the exhibition uh, was premised on, or kind of used as a point of departure, Walker Percy's 1961 novel, The Movie Goer, which effectively uses this figure of a kind of um, a circumambulation, a kind of uh, derive, um, where an outsider kind of comes closer and closer to the center of the city of New Orleans, um, you know, it, kind of day after Lent. Um, and I thought in many ways that this work um, by Tavares Strawn was a fantastic exemplification of some of the stakes, not only of that text, that novel, but of the show itself. Um, as many of you might know, this is a work um, that was made by an artist born in the Bahamas that um, would effectively be a, a, a massive uh, neon um, sculpture that was pulled by a tugboat down the Mississippi. Um, and there were several moments where visitors and viewers were kind of called um, to look at this work. And it kind of holds a contradiction, as I understand it. Franklin might correct me here. But the way that I see it, there's a contradiction. On the one hand, you see it and it's a kind of affirmation, right? You belong here no matter who you are. Um, looking at this thing, there's a place for you in this cultural landscape. But at the same time, there's a kind of perhaps more dark or sinister component to it, which is, you know, you belong here on this barge um, in the middle of nowhere. Um, and so there's this kind of simultaneous sense, and I think this was a really beautiful part of the exhibition, of um, a sense of commingling and cohabitation, but at the same time, um, a kind of insurgent sense of violence in terms of what that might mean, or, or of dislocation. Um, the second exhibition um, that I'm thinking about in terms of the kind of centrality of a black diasporic um, discourse to a larger conversation around uh, global contemporary art is Unji Ju's exhibition um, in Sharjah, the 12th uh, Sharjah Biennial, which is called The Past, the Present, the Possible. And you'll see that all three of these exhibitions are structured around an idea of temporality, interestingly enough, that um, kind of emphasizes an imminence of right now, but also situates that imminence within a kind of historical tradition 
trajectory that opens up certain possibilities for notions of futurity. Um, so this is a work, as many of you might know, the uh, you know Sharjah is uh, an emirate, one of the you know one of the emirates in the United Arab Emirates, located just 45 minutes north of Dubai, um, and um, it's an exhibition um, that Anjuju, who was at the New Museum before, organized um, that opened in March. And this is a work um, here by Gary Simmons, who interestingly enough is an artist who appears in all three of the exhibitions that I'll talk about. Um, this is a work called Across the Chalk Line, and what you see here um, is effectively a cricket, um, a cricket court that he's made um, in on the grounds of the of the biennial, um, using a line from CLR James's Beyond a Boundary. Um, you guys probably know CLR James, um, Afro Trinidadian um, critic um, who wrote the Black Jacobins. And so what um, here Simmons does is takes a line um, that CLR James quotes from a Kipling poem, the line the Eng from the poem The English Flag is, what do they know of England who only England know, um, and replaces England with cricket. So what do they know of cricket who only cricket know? And effectively what he does around the boundary is in the same chalk lines as the kind of lines of the rules of the game are drawn in, um, writes that line in four languages, English, Arabic, uh, Malayam, Malayanam, and, and Urdu. And so as many of you also know, in the UAE, only 20% of the folks who live there are actually Emirati. Um, the rest of the population um, is mostly South and Southeast Asian, um, so Pakistani, um, Indian, um, and Filipino. And so effectively what he's done is he's made a space that the kind of, um, you know, a, a community of many former British colonial subjects who play cricket um, as a result of that process of colonization can use to do so. And so what you're seeing here is an actual game of cricket that's being played. So the third moment is um, this one here um, from Okwe and Wazor's recent Venice Biennial. Um, and in my own estimation, the kind of two strongest um, centrifugal forces of the exhibition are on the one hand sound and two um, kind of African American in particular cultural production. As, as you walk in um, to the, the space designed by David Ajay in the, um, the Italian pavilion, uh, if you, you know, during the few, first few days of the opening of the exhibition, you would hear um, a series of slave songs um, at from the 19th century that um, Jason Moran had kind of invited a group of people to perform, as well as work songs um, after the end of slavery. Um, here you're seeing Terry Atkins' muffled drum, so um, the kind of, uh, you know, this is installed in the Arsenale, a kind of um, uh, pendant to the sounds that you would hear in the Giardini. Um, and in many ways I think that, you know, if you think about um, Kara Walker's opera that she's doing, if you think about um, Charles Gaines's um, yeah, manifestos that he's written, um, the kind of, uh, the idea of 19th century um, African-American sound is one of the kind of animating forces of this exhibition. Um, so looking at all three of these shows together, which I would say kind of define in many ways what we could considered to be a contemporary, um, co a conversation around contemporary art, at least within the context of biennials, um, is clustered around three sets of ideas. One, dislocation, um, as I've described before with Tavares. Um, two, a kind of freighted interactivity. All of these works kind of demand uh, mode of spectatorship. They, you know, they exist specifically to be looked at, um, but in ways that also kind of refuse that. So here, you know, there's a drum that can't be played. Um, you know, the with the um, the cricket. You know, there's a there's a you know a kind of boundary in and of itself for the cricket court. Um, so there are these kinds of refusals for that form of interaction. Activity. And then finally, um, there's a, as I've said already, there's a kind of uh, an, a, an articulation of what a global contemporary might mean that in some ways centralizes culture production from um, African American and black Atlantic culture, but within a conversation that also emphasizes connections to the Middle East, to South Asia, to East Asia, and to Latin America. Um, so that's one, one set of things that I'm, I'm thinking through. What does it mean um, when in some ways we enter center stage? And the second um, is about a, a shifting set of um, 
ways in which politics um, have been articulated in a contemporary art discourse. So here, just as a kind of cursory example, I'm juxtaposing, um, you know, two, um, you know, looking at artforum.com, two headlines that you would see. So the McGee Gallery closing, citing the changing art world, the inability to kind of survive with the, um, the kind of model of the art fair as the preeminent model by which um, not only is art collected, but the value of art is determined. And then on the other, um, the large largest, um, um, you know, the, lar the highest amount on record for a work of art sold. Um, and of course, we can't look at Les Femmes d'Alger, um, you know, the kind of Delacroix um, redux um, from the mid-1950s without thinking about the constant role of Africa, not only in terms of modernism, but also in terms of valuation. And so this is meant to kind of articulate in some ways the, um, yeah, the shifting economic stakes of that, that, that animate our conversation today. Um, the second is what I'm sure you all have heard, the kind of um, pull out of the entire class at USC um, from the MFA program. And so in response to the kind of professionalization of um, the art world through the M you know, MFA programs around the country, a kind of um, a repost to that, a refusal to engage in that. Uh, and here, oh, I guess. Here and here, I'm, I'm uh, using the uh, Instagram account of um, a for former teacher, Francis Stark, um, at USC. Um, and then finally, to kind of bring it to a more local context, um, the recent controversy here in New York around Paris's burning, which um, Brick Arts that coordinates Celebrate Brooklyn, which many of you might know, um, has the you know the concerts and movie screenings in the park, um, decided to screen this film from 25 years ago, um, iconic controversial film directed by Jenny Livingston. Um, and there, there's been a kind of um, a protest, a, um, a petition on change.org that has been organized around a set of hashtags. So again, it's interesting here to think about who the political protagonist is here because it's actually a collective that's only organized around social media. Um, and so the two are shut it down and Paris is burnt. Um, and I think what's interesting to me with this is that there's a real borrowing of a language um, from the social world. On the one hand, um, a language not only of retribution, um, but a kind of um, language of, of um, kind of um, reparation. So, you know, th they've asked that um, Jenny Livingston, you know, not r give the money for the profit that from her film to um, the original subjects of the film. And so borrowing this language um, specifically from slavery to think about the stakes of this debate. Um, and two, uh, a kind of equation, equation, equating of the film with a recent um, uh, kind kind of attention and mass mobilization around um, the death of um, African Americans by the police. And so making a direct link and analogy between those two things. And so I think what's interesting to me here is kind of pulling of the social forms of social media um, and the kind of discourse, the social discourse of mass mobilization around anti-black state violence, specifically within the context of art and culture. So. I guess some notes um, for my own thinking and for ours today. Um, one, um, so what do we do when the terms of the debate are no longer simply about representation? In other words, get us in the door, how many, what, are, what you know, what's the quota, but actually um, can think more clearly about um, the terms of which artists are making work. Many of the artists um, who, you know, my generation comes from that has have en enabled me and allowed me to be doing the work that I'm doing. Um, we're not making work that was about representation. And so, in what ways can we think through the stakes of meaning making in kind of more expansive ways? Um, and also, what are the kind of political stakes um, of, of making work today? Um, secondly, how is art informed by social and political changes? And I'm thinking both of, as I've just said, um, the kind of form and structure as well as the language um, by which art kind of uh, appropriates or borrows from social movements and then um, can then respond and then re-inform how those are operating. Um, and then finally, um, if in some ways, you know, looking at these three examples that I spoke of earlier, the lines around the global contemporary have nicely been drawn to centralize in some ways African-American and black diasporic culture, um, in what ways can we describe a language to think through other forms of alliances with parts of that geography, the Caribbean and Africa, that have not necessarily been as central to that conversation, um, and also what language, you know, to kind of resuscitate, you know, kind of third world alliance making discourse or a south-south um, connection from the 1970s, what what are the kind of um, the, the germane or, or kind of Cap the capacious languages that we might talk about, um, connections of uh, people from, you know, obviously the United States to other movements and other artistic communities around the world.
<clears throat> what is there left to say? <laughs> um, I was happy to go last at first. Now I'm like, oh man, you guys said it all. You came, you came from the, the structure of the museum. You came from the poetics of what we're seeing in the moment. Um, those are the kind of things I want to touch on. But I have, in some ways, I, I guess I have to say, um, first and foremost, um, thank you, Koyo, and thank you, Gabriella, and everybody at 154 for just doing this. I can't believe I'm in Brooklyn at a fair, which is always weird when you do these kind of things at a fair, but it feels less weird in the context of 154 than it does, say, our Basel. Um, and it's, it's wonderful to be here and to see everybody and to be here with uh, Stephen and esteemed colleagues. And I mean, that was the thing. I, you see who's doing the panel and you think, ah, this, I just want to sit there and listen. And so I got to sit there and listen. Now, what do I have to say? Um, <clears throat> I, but I would, I would really um, say that I, it's a thing where the topic is something where I have so much to say and at the same time so little. Um, and it reminds me, I'm reminded of something that Gary Simmons said to me since you, know, you, you talked about that through line, that, that amazing through line through those three shows, um, was that, and, and this was 20 something years ago when he said like, you're reading too much of the magazines, like you're paying too much attention to everybody else's thing. You need to put your head down and just, just think and just do your own thing. And so I think that's part of the reason why we're here, um, because people create these opportunities for us to do what we do, which is why we're talking about this topic as if it were, you know, a sort of rare topic. And I feel like it still is, unfortunately, but that has changed a lot. Um, I think back in terms of personal connections to the fact of being from New York, there was the Studio Museum in Harlem. So growing up within that context, having that there and having the idea of looking at art always came to me from a very diasporic place. It came from a place that was open to um, conversation, I think, in that way, in, in a way that isn't perhaps what we see um, overall. Um, I also just want to uh, think about from that space and from that specific space, I now work um, from Los Angeles County Museum of Art and from an encyclopedic point of view, like Krista. Um, the museum started in 1910 as a department within the Museum of Natural History in Los Angeles. So going back to that point, which of course, in the scope of museums in this country, um, you know, it comes from that, from that stage where we're beginning to try and understand each other. And I think the context of it being at the Natural History Museum is actually perfect. Um, for my advantage in thinking about the ways in which we do business now in the present, I find it um, very much a strength to be working from the point of view of a place that for us has only existed since 1965, uh, when the museum became an entity unto itself at its current campus. But backtracking for a second, and I'm reminded of the Museum of Modern Art, and particularly of Alfred Barr and the trajectory of how we think about art in this country, or avant-garde art. And, and this is something that I tried to talk about very much in Prospect, was the fact that our museums are supposed to be these places for dialogue. They're the, the places where we come to talk about culture, to have a, a certain space of negotiating um, hard truths or, or things that we you know, can't talk about in other spaces, workplaces, et cetera. And, and so looking back at the trajectory of some of those early exhibitions, and of course, um, you know, this is post-1913, so the idea of an avant-garde, the idea of a European context, of a Western canon, is, is something that's there. But there are these exhibitions like Negro art, like Native American art, pre-Columbian art, and these all were part of the, the, the sort of thrust of the museum being this place to talk about people and to understand each other better. Uh, a place where we could come together. 
And so that was the, I think that, that is something that I tried to, to talk about within that exhibition. And it's something that we think about a lot um, and return to frequently. We bill ourselves as you know, the largest museum west of Chicago. Uh, we have over 120,000 objects. Um, <laughs> it's, a, it's a place where we are trying literally to do everything for everyone and do that with art, do that with programming, do that with music, do that with film, do that with education, across the board. And so there is this, um, the ideas like we're talking about today are, are, are frequently a part of our um, daily existence. And I think it's interesting to note, and it keeps coming up, I think, in my conversations, especially with um, younger colleagues who are trying to um, find a place within museums, is this changing relationship, this changing sort of sphere. Um, I mean, I can't believe, I'm, I'm so, I'm honored to see Prospect with uh, Sharjah and Venice and my dear friends and um, people who have changed the conversation a little bit. Um, but we are coming from this space where this is a, a moment and you have initiatives like we're one of five museums uh, who's part of this Mellon Diversity Initiative. And I think it's us, the Museum of Fine Arts in Houston, the Art Institute in Chicago, uh, Kansas City, the Kemper, and I'm going to forget one. Dallas? No, the High in Atlanta. Sorry. How could I forget that? Um, <laughs> um, so there's that that's happening. There's also uh, initiatives. Um, through the Irvine Foundation that are touching um, many of our institutions. So you have LACMA with a space already existing in the middle of, I guess, uh, central LA in downtown. Um, what is the Charles White Elementary School? Charles White, um, the, the artist. Uh, such an important figure to LA. So there are all these things that are going on and there's all this stuff that's sort of bubbling in these conversations and um, it's it's, it's an honor to be a part of it. Um, and I just also should add that one of the, the, the reasons um, why I think of having so little to say and so much to say is that I'm also walking out of um, an installation right now on the artist Noah Purifoy that Stephen mentioned. Purifoy was born in Birmingham in 1917, moved to LA in 1950, first black artist to uh, attend Chouinard or CalArts as we know it. And, and he seemed to have this, this constant sort of um, fight between wanting to do something um, and wanting to just make art. And, and there was this, this constant contradiction in which at times he could not do both at the same time. Um, this is a guy who co-founded the art center at Watts Towers. Um, this is a man who, who made his, his largest artwork out of the, the refuse and the debris from the Watts Rebellion in 1965, 50th anniversary, just like LACMA right now. And, 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 and at a certain point where there was a degree of conversation around the work, we can talk about it in the context of assemblage and funk and Dada and California in particular, um, and people like Keenholes and people like Herms and people like Betty Sarr, and, and there was this point where he just decided it's not enough um, in order for me to truly affect any degree of change. I have to let the art go and just concentrate. So, so he had a degree in social work and, and decided that he wasn't gonna make art for a period of time. That lasted about 13 years. And um, it's the, the, that kind of space that, that we're exploring. And it reminds me, I mean, we, we ended, uh, Thomas, on, on um, on Paris is burning, and I mean, all this stuff is happening right now, and this year has just been crazy. <laughs> and and um, so so it's like, how, how to be most effective? And I think we're all being effective right now by being here, um, but it's something that obviously um, goes back and forth. Purifoy eventually decided that he needed to get back to his work, he started making art again after 13 years, after participating on the California Arts Council, uh, under Jerry Brown, literally giving away money to artists and organizations. And, and, and promptly, I mean, some would say out of necessity, but promptly left the city 
and went out to the desert in uh, Joshua Tree and never came back and, and died out there in 2004, created this massive 10 acre site of sculptures and awesome lodge works um, that, that, that people know of and go to and it's become this sort of um, retreat. Um, but every day he got up and made work for essentially himself and no one else. So I, I don't know, I think those are just some of the things that um, come into the play in the context of this conversation. I'm happy to be here. Um, thank you. Thank you, all three of you, for such provocative presentations. Um, we have a lot. We have a lot to talk about here. And, um, and I think that, you know, sort of, I, I always feel like the, the sort of job of the moderator is kind of to figure out the through line, you know, when there are a number of, of uh, conversations on the table. And I think that one of them, I actually think that a big one, is, is coming back to this question of culture and what do we mean? Because, you know, it, 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 on a certain level, you know, I woke up on Tuesday and I thought, okay, culture, well, you know, African American, Yoruba, this, that. What do we do? And I, you know, and our, and our, we were have started an email conversation, and I said, well, you know, let's not do that. And they didn't. And um, and but what what is so interesting is that you know the nods, the historic nods that you all have made, and I and I'm really interested in in Franklin talking about the museum as a place of dialogue, and it immediately made me think of the Met in 1969, which would have been considered a temple, not a place of dialogue. And then suddenly what happens at the Met in 1969 is the show Harlem on my mind. And it comes in, and it's photography from Harlem, and James Vandersee suddenly gets discovered, and Critics freak out. Hilton Kramer freaks out, and he says, he basically says, and I'm going to quote him really badly because I want to, and, um, and he says, you know, this is the end of the museum as a temple. Mm. And, and I remember reading this when I was working on a, on, on a show at the ICA in Boston about almost 20 years ago. And, and he was, and I thought, oh, how snotty. And, and I thought, you know what, he was probably right. He was probably right because, you know, thousands, tens of thousands of people went to see this show. And there was one day that the museum had to be shut down at 3.30 in the afternoon because the line to get in was too long. And, um, and so, so, but that moment where people started, at least at that institution, at that moment, to talk about sort of the, the infection, if you will, of art by culture, of art, and let's be more specific, art by race. And in a, in a sense, what, what you three have done is talk about um, in your different ways, and I think Krista with, with objects and the way, the really unique way that your museum is structured, which allows you to do the work that you do, um, which might be more complicated to do at LACMA or at, you know, or at MoMA or somewhere else. Um, to what, what I'm hearing is a discussion about how, how race works in terms of the curatorial project, in terms of an institutional agenda. I actually think maybe even more so in, in terms of an institutional agenda than in, say, my institution does A, your institution does C, my institution does Z. Um, and I think that what you're starting to get into, and I think all three of you are working really hard at thinking about not so much what Africa means or what diaspora means. Or, and, and I think that those are, are important questions. But what you're doing is, I think, sort of taking those, those notions and sort of then thinking, how do those notions affect what global contemporary art means? And I think that that's a more interesting question. I think that's a more important question. And all of you, in a way, start thinking about, and this is, I guess, where we can start. Um, I would love to hear what you have to say about practices that realign our notions of that being. And so for Krista, it was we work with different kinds of objects and we put them in different places. With Thomas, it was there were these three shows that really center sort of African American activity and, and sort of the, the enunciations of diaspora. And there it would be interesting to think about how actually other artists who are also working in diaspora and amongst these groups 
are contributing to that those kinds of conversations. And I think I think in Franklin's case, you 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 basically laid out for us the very the very important issue of audience and does it always matter? Because Pierre Ford made work for himself. And now he'd so yeah, you know, for those of us who live in LA, it's a pilgrimage site. And that we go and we're dutiful art people and we do this. And so, you know, I'm I'm just sort of thinking about out loud, but what I would do is ask you all how you sort of think about how you handle this sort of huge range of different things, different balls flying around in the air in this political moment, and at you know at at you in in terms of the things that interest you. I, I'm reminded. Was that working? Yeah. Um, since you start with the Met show, I'm gonna bring it back to LA for a second. What what made change? What made uh, the sort of museum respond was very similar, obviously, in 1970 and 1971 in particular, where you had people agitating in the same way that they did with the Met, and then you had an exhibition that happened directly in response to that agitation. You had a series of three, actually. Of course, then there wasn't another one until 1976 and David Driscoll, <laughs> but there were three. And they were all in response to political agitation. And I think part of, I mean, the Irvine, the Mellon, part of it is a response to what's happening within this moment. Um, so I'm first reminded uh, of that. In terms of, in terms of ways in which dealing with, I think, audience, um, I, you know, that, that ability to look at the contemporary in the context of the past is, I think a way for us to speak in the present um, that can be really effective and brings us back to the other part of the equation, which is specifically on the object and what the art does in the first place. I would just, uh, is this working? Um, I mean, I think, Stephen, I, you know, what you're kind of talking about is that, you know, the politics of museum work, mm. politics of, and it's something, you know, as somebody whose research area is the history of museums, I think, re, I think, you know, maybe obsessively about what, you know, we mean. Um, cons it's like a constant effort at, in museums, and I'm sure you both find this in your institutions, that just the little pushbacks when you know you're looking at the website for an exhibition of George Asodi's exhibition, you know exhibition which has been over and over described as a contemporary art exhibition, and you know the end of the website says, you know, come, you know, please check out our other African exhibition, Hassan Hajaj, my rock stars. It's, you know those little mm -hmm. moments where, you know, let's not frame it that way. Let's make the link, but let's not frame it as the other African exhibition, and not even include mm -hmm. the word art. Um, what are the museum spaces? I mean, we talk in the New York Museum, there's often, you know, the contemporary art gallery. It's understood that that's the American contemporary art gallery, just in the way that when we talk about MoMA, which, you know, for the large part of its history is the Museum of Modern European and American Art, you know, with the exception of its 60s moments where they were letting in artists like Ibrahim El Salahi, and of course what's happening now, but I mean, that's the baseline, and I said I think being very careful with how we label and define things. Um, and I think at Newark we have a particular you know challenge and opportunity is we have very different communities and we have a very strong base of uh, African American audience, and also very strong um, population of recent uh, immigrants from Africa, first generation Nigerians, first generation Ghanaians. The, the first lady of Ghana was just visiting Newark yesterday, and that's a huge part of the population. And those two audiences are, are not the same. And um, that is also a source of sometimes tension within the museum in terms of programming and who you're speaking to and um, who you're serving. So I, I think there's a lot of kind of politics embedded in this kind of work. Thank you for pointing us, Stephen, to, towards thinking about the kind of history of exhibition making as like the, in some ways, the haunting force of a lot of what we're talking about today. I think, you know, one shift um, in terms of moving from a place like the Studio Museum to the Museum of Modern Art is the kind of uh, 
deep sense of history that's been codified and written that exists in a place like the Museum of Modern Art. Obviously, the Studio Museum, which was founded in 1968 and began having exhibitions in 1969, um, has an incredible 45 plus year history, but um, doesn't necessarily have to contend with history, capital H, in the same way that the Museum of Modern Art does. And I think even in just looking at the exhibitions that are up now there or have recently gone up, I'm thinking of Yoko Ono, the uh, Latin American, you know, Latin American construction, the architecture show, um, the recent painting show um, that closed a couple of months ago. All of those in different ways are, in some ways, um, how would you call them? Reanimations uh, of earlier exhibitions. Yoko Ono's speculative fake show that she staged herself, the, you know, Latin American architecture show that kind of looked at the first half of the second part of the 20th century, um, and then the kind of history of, you know, American painting shows that existed um, at the museum um, in its, you know, in the 50s and 60s. So I think in many ways um, that kind of, um, yeah, that haunting force or that um, that reiterative um, force is something that is, is deeply important to how institutions function and, and to kind of take up your point is, you know, is highly specific. I mean, it, you know, just to go back to the term that Coyo um, asked us to organize today's conversation around, you know, the kind of typology or the... Um, you know the the knowledge, the system of knowledge production that structures our various institutions is are the the contingent terms by which we're able to produce anything, and I think that contending with them and trying to, if not remake, um, you know, refabricate in some ways that history is incredibly interesting. And you know, I think one thing that for me is particularly exciting um, to be at MoMA is to kind of think about the centrality of both African American and African artists working outside of. Knowledge not only a, 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 a kind of a, you know commercial art world or what would be described self-described as an avant-garde, but actually um, you know uh, to, even today we are still outside of many of our established kind of canons. And so if you look at Alfred Barr's um, kind of you know early shows there you know of African American self-taught artists and they're of African artists working in idioms of craft and um, textile. And so I think to me um, what's particularly exciting is kind of in looking at that history how much of that work that in some ways um, announces the kind of potentiality of this institution has yet to come fully to bear. Um, and so it means that we, you know, excitingly have some work to do. Well, at MoMA, you have those wonderful moments with, you know, Edmondson in 1937 and Jacob Lawrence in 1941. And if you haven't seen that show, go see that show. Um, and I was in the Latin American architecture show yesterday, actually. And, and what, what amazed me in reading the label copy was how MoMA inserts itself into the history of African um, Latin American architecture. And the, well, our show in 1937 and our show in 1958 or something like that. I was like, oh, smell you. <laughs> well, you know, it's, it is, it's, yeah. the, it's, the, it's the museum, it's the museum of modern art. And exactly. The, the logic of modernism is self-reflexivity, exactly. right? Exactly. <laughs> and so no one it, is more self-reflexive than MoMA and me. <laughs> MoMA was also not so MoMA-ish back then. And right. I think in large part, you know, the first professionally trained curator at MoMA was Dorothy Miller, who was yeah. trained at the Newark Museum in our yeah. apprenticeship program yeah. and trained under John Cotton Dana, who had a very different view, an anti-temple yeah. idea of yeah. what a museum should be. Yeah. And Holger Cahill, um, yeah. you know, organized you know, collective folk art at the Newark Museum yeah. and then came to MoMA. And so there are these important museum histories that, you know, when you think yeah. about institutional representation that I right. think are important to, yeah. to draw to the surface. Yeah. And I think, too, in, in terms of African art and sort of the really deep roots of the exhibition of African art in New York City. It goes back to the early 20th century. I mean, you've got Brooklyn in 1923. You've got, you know, um, I think the Met by the 30s, and so, or MoMA. I mean, they, they, things are showing, right. and people are seeing these things, and they come along, you know, they come out of smaller exhibitions from the 19-teens. But what, you know, we don't have a lot of time left, so I wanted to first see if you all have questions for each other, and I'd also like the chance to open that up for at least a couple questions from the audience. And so. You can listen to these two all day. He can listen to these two all day, and I can listen to all these three all day, and you all don't have all day. And so I'd like to open it up to questions from the audience. Is there anyone who has a question that they'd like to ask? If you don't, we can keep talking. So, yeah, like, oh. Yes, no. 
I can put on my professor cap and start calling hey, on people. Hey, we have people. a question here. Do we have? The question was, what do we see as the future of cultural institutions and how we see them changing as, as cultural, in specific institutions and how we see them changing as I'll we jump forward. in here. Um, you know, I have to say, first and foremost, I'm so deeply embedded to the Studio Museum in Harlem for, you know, allowing my, the, whatever crazy ideas were in my head to like actually have a space to be in dialogue with other people, artists, curators. I, I, I think that, you know, the, the kind of, um, potentials of emerging curators and emerging artists, that, that institution, in addition to many other things, plays such a pivotal role in terms of artists of African descent and curators of African descent. I think what we'll see is, um, you know, that the language that we have for cultural, cultural specificity will kind of expand to every institution. And I think that, you know, more and more institutions will acknowledge their own, you know, way of thinking as culturally specific um, and determined by, a, a, you know, historic um, and geographic set of conditions that enable them to do their work. I mean, I think you see that in some clear ways that places like the Studio Museum that have long, you know, the studio and the Studio Museum's name comes from the studio program that has existed since 1969. Um, you know, the fact that the Harlem part of its name, that everything that happens there is imagined as a site-specific project exhibition. These are increasingly ways that larger institutions are working, working directly with artists, inviting artists to have residencies, doing commissions, um, imagining their place not as autonomous as we were told they were, but actually, you know, uh, cited and conditioned by that site, um, I think are increasingly just becoming a, a new kind of a, a norm. And so I think that what we'll see is, um, you know, uh, a way in which the the kind of logic that has animated culture specific institutions kind of increasing to proliferate, and I think the other part of that is, you know, that um, in some in some key ways, you know, every institution can kind of do a work that no other institution can. I mean, I think that what's exciting in the place that I currently work is that, you know, in, in walking through the exhibitions, there are ways in which those shows could not exist in other places because of the specific logic um, that historically structures that institution. And I think that every institution has that um, and will, will mean that a place like the Studio Museum or El Museo or any other institution that self-articulates as culturally specific will not become obsolete, quite the contrary. As the work that they've done increasingly goes elsewhere, they will continue to serve a particular um, and, you know, like every other institution, un unheralded purpose. So that's what I hope happens and I imagine. We have a couple questions here. <laughs> I just wanted to follow on what Thomas just said, looking at what's right above you, culturally specific curating and in institutions. What do you think the role is of an individual curator to do what you just said? There's one thing for a director to have a vision or for there to be an archivist or for there to be somebody on staff who's very aware of an institution's history to remind everybody this is where we're coming from. But would you say, you know, it's the responsibility of a curator joining an institution, one, to learn the history of that institution, um, two, to think about why are we using this language now, is this the right language for this time, and then three, what are the modes of exhibition that are going to make that most transparent to our audiences? Like, what, what can curators do in the big picture? I'm the non-curator here. <laughs> I, don't, I mean, I think, uh, I don't know, there's a number of things. I, I mean, I, I guess part of what, what I try to do in my practice is, um, is to shorten the distance. Um, almost every exhibition, including the current exhibitions, um, especially George's exhibition, which features Nigerian monarchs who are pharmacologists in Houston, is to uh, at once showcase, you know, the, you know, kind of culturally specific project, if you will, in Nigeria. Um, but also say that that's part of who we are in America as well. And to kind of, ins you know, kind of bleed these stories into some larger story. Um, and on the flip side, uh, again, speaking to the issue of like naming and thinking about museum spaces, um, 
you know, MoMA is just as much of a culturally specific institution as the Studio Museum yeah. of Harlem. And the way we way we frame even curatorial departments, it's you know, there's a lot of um, embedded assumptions uh, and um, value judgments in the way art history departments are organized, the way curatorial departments are organized, you know, that you have in this day and age plenty of museums that think nothing of having a department of Africa, the Americas, and the Pacific. I mean, you know. It, or yeah. more. Or more. <laughs> um, so I, I don't know. I'm kind of, I'm kind of blabbing on, but I don't know if I answered the question. But I, I do think it is, it's, it's two, there are two, uh, it's dual forces. I mean, it's both putting the works, you know, for me, works from the African continent and its diaspora in a broader conversation, but it's also changing the perception of what African art might mean. And in the U.S., I mean, Stephen alluded to the history, uh, museum, uh, Metropolitan Museum has a very strong role, MoMA has a very strong role in our expectations, the general audience's expectations that when they go to see African art, it's masks and figural sculptures. So I feel like my job is not just to get these artists in conversation with the rest of the museum, but also when school kids, when groups come to the museum and they're studying African art, whatever that means, they're studying Ata um, in addition to older traditions. And their baseline is completely, I like to think, is shifted from expectations. Some of our conversation yesterday rested on the idea of critics and criticism, or lack thereof more so. What do you feel is the role of the media in reframing what you all are very carefully framing in your own institutions and how it may affect how you're shifting baselines for students that come to visit and how you're presenting African art? <laughs> I, I don't know. I just I find it really interesting within this moment that the me when you say the media, like I think about a, a sort of slower moving machine, but then if I think about it further, I think about all of the things that are happening social media wise, like like that. I mean, I, I just read the whole Paris burning thing like this morning. I, you know, I, it's just there are certain people that are working in the sphere of social media that are so beyond the conversations that are happening in traditional media right now that it's, it's amazing. Um, I mean, I'm, I, Kimberly Drew, for one, I mean, there, mm -hmm. there, are just, there are a lot of people that are forcing people, I think, yeah. to take things into account on, on social media in a way that I hope that our criticism and, and apparatus of art criticism catches up eventually. I think following that too, there are ways in which, um, <clears throat> if we're talking, actually Kimberly Drew is a great example of um, things like the Facebook or the Twitter, or um, that that suddenly things sort of can spill out <clears throat> in ways that they haven't been able to before. And so even the 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 thing that Thomas mentioned about the USC students, I, I read that on Twitter yesterday morning. And I live in LA, and I had no idea. Well, I don't live in LA, but I sort of live in LA. But um, I had no idea that these things were happening. And then, and then, you know, it, it sort of gives you an opportunity. And but I think coming back to your question, Kristen, I think so. If I'm hearing you correctly, you're asking how you know whether the these the media shapes or has a responsibility to sort of help shape the way, you know, change in the, in the artistic landscape. And I think all too... Are they reframing what you're saying carefully reframing by not saying you know, I think at times they are. I mean, you know, you can, you can do... I, let's take as an example now, dig this. All right, when it came to PS1, great show, blah, 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 blah. And then Ken Johnson in the New York Times writes what is perhaps the stupidest review of a show I have ever read in my life. And... And what happened there is that, you know, for all of the framing around LA and art and, and all these different things, that that show was so careful to delineate, he boiled it all down to, well, you know, how can this show have done anything because the art's not that, that expensive and what was it, assemblage isn't political, which is completely wrong, it's prov provably wrong. But, and then, but then what you have in, in the media today that you did not have before is the mass freak out over everything. 
And so we, we like to be freaked out constantly. And so someone can say, the sky is blue, and somebody over there is freaking out over it, and starting petitions and doing all that. And so what the, what the discourse generated, and I think this may be different, and you, know, you guys can, you can chime in, um, what is different is that those kinds of things create conversations that perhaps you know, in the slower moving world of mainstream media, they didn't before. Mm -hmm. I mean, a similar thing with, there was a review of Venice a couple of weeks ago oh, yeah. on Artnet. Freak out. Yeah, absolute freak out, and rightly so. I, I do think that the role of social media, I mean, does have provide the pushback, but I do think it's a good question because you try really hard to frame something in a certain way. And, you know, when uh, George's show was opening up, the Star Ledger's, you know, headline was like the little kings of, of Nigeria. I'm just like, oh my God, you know. And Ken Johnson, um, you know. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> we, we, I did this exhibition called Unbounded, which was uh, four of us in the New York Museum who are, you include contemporary art as part of our work, uh, created an exhibition of works in our, from our contemporary art across boundaries, um, present, work together to present it. And uh, Benjamin Ginocchio, you know, wonderful review in the New York Times. Ken Johnson's review, again, complained that these are not so-called blue chip artists. We don't know who these artists are. And we're kind of yeah. like, well, that's the point. You know, you should know who these artists are. And so there's, but I think that the more, you know, when this kind of things happen, there is a pushback through social media. And that is where, you know, hopefully the, the reframing happens. Just one quick uh, from me, other thought. Um, I think that, one thing to, to kind of push back on the kind of possibilities of social media is I think that institutions also, um, as much as um, they can kind of take the handle and have curators, you know, like tweet and Instagram, I think it's also like the, the, the timing, the pace of an institution, of a museum can offer an alternative and actually a kind of space of um, risk and, and danger and possibility in a way that um, is actually foreclosed in some ways by social media. And I'm just thinking of like the kind of debate that raged on Facebook about the Celebrate Brooklyn and that there were people who were coming out um, and defending artists, defending, you know, the kind of um, ambivalences they had about, you know, Jenny Livingston's film. And I think that, you know, art, um, bad art, good art should make us and sometimes f make us feel ambivalent. And that, that actually is an important thing to have space to describe and that the kind of the pace and the speed at which that debate raged on, you know, made people, you know, made everybody into like racists who would come and support that film. Yes. Um, and I think that, you know, <laughs> what institutions can do is, you know, kind of bows out, stretch a little bit to say, wait a second, like what are the merits of this thing? And, and to kind of offer a, a, a different kind of temporality than exists in the kind of, you know, speed through which opinions are made and then disseminated. Um, and I actually think that there's an interesting connection between your question and the previous question about the kind of role of the curator, just because I don't think it's a, co a coincidence that like so much of, you know, who travels and Instagrams whatever artworks they see, um, in some ways determines what art is getting shown and who is yeah. getting to show that work. Um, and I say that to say that, you know, um, on the one hand, I'm a deep believer as somebody who, you know, like Adrian Piper, who won the Golden Lion this year, um, that like subjectivity is a thing that was refused um, by, you know, in this moment in the 80s when she, you know, when she was insisting upon it, that like who we are informs how we see things. And it was like just when artists of color were beginning to have more opportunities that like French deconstruction came in and was like, no more, death of the subject. And it's like, okay, that's convenient. <laughs> but I actually do think, so, so I'm, I clearly come, you know, I, I, I'm a baby of that way of thinking yeah. that like who we are is deeply informative. At the same time, I think it is only in, informative is insofar as you can not just tweet, 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 Instagram, 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 but kind of think through how the particular conjunction of who you are and who you are, you know, plural, informs a much larger social, um, you know, set of relationships. And to me, that was what the success of, you know, all three of the shows that I mentioned earlier was, was that they were coming from very particular subject positions, but not, they weren't, auto, they weren't autobiographical. They weren't self-writing, but they were conditioned by the fact of them being who they are. Um, so I think that's the kind of, you know, the ambivalence of, you know, self-writing in relationship to exhibition making. Yeah, I just wanted to maybe that we, uh, if you have a take on, uh, I'm always um, very intrigued by this uh, 
uh, bill of uh, diversity and uh, multiplicity that uh, American culture, American society, American history sort of, uh, you know, uh, thrive on quite uh, um, specifically in the arts and so on. And, uh, and the discrepancy between that, uh, let's say, promotional take on this diversity to the reality in institutions, you know. I mean, I was very pleased to hear Christa's, uh, Christa uh, saying that an institution like MoMA or any other, Whitney or whatever, to stay here in New York are just as cultural specific as an institution like Studio Museum. So what is it that makes it, that makes the, the gap between this idea of uh, diversity, but that is not reflected in institution and specifically in exhibition making throughout the different eras of art historical, uh, you know, uh, periods, if you want, you know. So maybe all the four of you have an idea about that. And this is actually what I was also thinking when I was, you know, thinking about this panel. How, what do you think about it? Is your question about diversity, existing diversity in the museums? Gap the gap between the, uh, the yeah. discourse about yeah. diversity and the lack and of... And how it plays out on and the how ground. And how it plays exactly. out. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean I, I mean, I think that this is the subject that everybody is focusing on right now. I mean, Franklin talked about the Mellon initiatives at various museums. Um, Jen Mergel and I are leading a diversity initiative for the Association of Art Museum Curators um, where we're focusing on this as an issue going forward because it's not a diverse organization um, and there is diversity in the field but I think um, a lot of it gets down to you know where do you start where do you introduce uh, you know museums as a career art history as a career I think you know we're there's you know we have a teenage program at the Newark Museum, which is mo is a very diverse program, and it introduces to people to museums, to the art and the science part of what we do at the Newark Museum, and kind of gets them to think about uh, a museum career, whether that is a cura you know a curator or or something else. Um, but I think you know it's 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 something that everybody. Uh, Tom Finkelpearl, uh, it's his huge initiative here in New York City. I think everybody really. This seems to be a moment where people are realizing. This is a real problem um, in not just diversity in terms of ethnicity, but I think perspective, because you know, I don't really add diverse ethnicity to what I do, but I do think I bring a diverse perspective when I'm in a room with curators who, who are centered elsewhere um, because of what my baseline comes uh, as an art historian. So many forms of diversity. I don't know, it's kind of blabbing on. I don't know if you guys have anything to add. I think in the in the broad picture that, and I haven't I mean looked closely enough, but if you look at say the the last ten years, and it seems like what you're getting is the difference between diversity that is spoken versus diversity that is actually lived. Um, I I, th I think you would see that based upon the changing um, structure of curatorial departments, at least in the contemporary sphere. I think you would see that over the last five to 10 years, absolutely. Um, I think the other thing is the idea, I guess well, for us in the, in the encyclopedic space, one thing that seems to accelerate this idea is that the place in which we have these discussions is the here and now, right? So within our contemporaneous moment. And if we're talking about even antiquities, uh, uh, that, that there is this conversation that can be had through contemporaries. For example, we did an exhibition with Ai Weiwei. We showed his um, zodiac, the, the uh, large sculptures. And those are based off of his own relationship to this palace that was built in the 18th century. And we also had work in the collection that was from maybe only 20 years removed from when the palace was actually made. And so there was this conversation between time that um, accelerates the conversation or that brings people to the conversation on a present level. And we can only do that in the here and now. 
So I feel like there there is these conversations that happen, like for instance in LA, there's the biggest Korean population outside of Korea. So we have a lot of that on view at a given time. And that there are these, these conversations that are just happening from a contemporary perspective because they have to. I guess I'm, I'm equally um, suspicious or hesitant to celebrate diversity or multiplicity for its own sake, um, as much as you know, it can be a way to um, a kind of decoy by which to further a conversation. I think clearly, you know, if we can learn anything from um, both the political sphere, you know, if thinking about you know, what quotas and diversity has meant for representation before our current president, but in the previous administration meant, or in terms of, you know, kind of, um, you know, the world of Wall Street where there are now people who make hundreds of thousands of dollars by, you know, to ensure that that the workforce is representative of people of color. I think both of those lessons indicate that like the fact of having people of color in positions does not guarantee anything. Um, but I think, yeah, I think with that said that, um, you know, the, uh, that I certainly know that I, my generation and looking at the people who've been on this panel yesterday and um, my, my colleagues and peers at other institutions, certainly I think have more opportunities than a generation before me, as Franklin indicated. And I think, um, you know, one difference is that there, you know, uh, there are clear historical markers of what it's meant to enter the mainstream and so that um, our ability to do that doesn't necessarily have to be as tokenized or as specific. It can, you know, it, can, it doesn't have to speak to general um, sensibility but can be completely particular in its own way of thinking. I think, you know, the clearly just because there have been a number of African American curators who've been able to enter institutions, it doesn't, does not mean that the work is done. Um, I think particularly in relationship to um, Native folks, that I think is a huge issue in this country in particular. And um, even thinking about, you know, kind of larger institutions' commitment to arts in the Middle East, in, you know, East Asia and Latin America, that clearly, uh, you know, if you look at major initiatives around this country that leave certain parts of the world, namely, you know, sub-Saharan Africa, um, out of the picture. And so, um, yeah, I'm, I'm weary of the kind of ability to use the language of multiplicity um, as a, a cure-all. But I think with that said, um, you know, I think we can take stock of the changes that have happened and, and use those as a kind of traction um, to continue to make good on, on um, the work of really not only curators, but artists. I mean, really artists who have insisted upon um, being shown in a specific kind of a way um, and then have you know, allowed for um, folks like us to be able to um, you know, kind of ensure that that work is being done in the context of institutions. Okay, I'm going to use my prerogative as moderator because we're running way over. <laughs> um, and so I want to thank all of you uh, for your wonderful, wonderful contributions. And I want to thank the audience for your great questions. And I'm, and I'm very grateful for a terrific conversation. And so, but if we don't get off the stage, Christian Hay is going to kill me. Um, and I will have to go into exile. And so um, thank you all for being here. And um, enjoy the art. Thank you.